I'm Maureen Metcalf, host of Innovating Leadership, co-creating our future. I'm also the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. Today, we welcome Dr. Mansoor Javidan, best-selling author and executive director of the Najafi Global Mindset Institute at the Thunderbird Business School of Global Management at the Arizona State University. Mansoor, your insights on leadership and trust worldwide will help our leaders be future ready. So thank you for joining us. Today's interview is sponsored by the International Leadership Association. Mansoor will receive a Lifetime Achievement Award at the upcoming Global Conference in Vancouver on October 12th through the 15th. So Mansoor, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's start with how do you define leadership? All right. Well, I actually have a pretty simple definition of leadership, and this is the definition that we have used in our research on leadership across cultures. And very simply put, we define leadership as a process of mobilizing, motivating, and empowering people to get things done. What is so unique about leaders? They provide a picture, a story that should be attractive to the recipients of that story, which is the employees, the direct reports, investors, clients, suppliers. That story is really critical. The image, the picture of the future and the direction that this organization or this group is moving towards. So that's a very important part of what leaders do. And by the way, in our studies of over 100 countries, that works. Not just in the U.S. or in Canada, but pretty much everywhere. Of course, there are nuances of how that story is told. For example, in some cultures and countries, the way that executives and CEOs speak about what the organization is all about is rooted in the history of the country. So they connect. We are contributing to our country. We are expanding the capabilities of our country by whatever it is that we do in our organization. So the storytelling is a really big part of the leadership process. The other part is making sure that the people that work on the team or in the organization have the skills and the resources to get to that story. I mean, the whole point of that story is to show the path towards something, some objective. And of course, it's not enough just to have a bunch of motivated employees if they don't have the skills or the resources to do the job. So the essence of leadership is managing people and managing the task and developing a future that is the foundation on which you manage the people and you manage the task. I love that. So it is bringing people to a point where they can envision that future that you have imagined for the organization, that we share it. Exactly. Yes. And often that happens by poster or slogan. And I appreciate that we have to understand and feel the story, not see the poster on the wall. You know, I actually used to work in the industry. I took a long sabbatical from my university and worked for a CEO because I, I wanted to see how leaders work in real life, in actuality, not just in an academic sense. And this CEO all his communication and all the language he used was about shareholder value. We're here to add to our shareholder value, satisfy our shareholders. And I kept asking him, well, does your supervisor really understand and care uh, who is the shareholder and what's the value to them? Aren't there important things about the employees, the organization that would excite them? they would still give you the shareholder value. But you got to tell them a story that communicates, attaches, attracts them. If you're a finance person, yeah, shareholder value. Oh my God, that's amazing. But if you're a production guy and your job is managing the supply chain, you have so many other important things that you need to worry about. The outcome of all that hard work, et cetera, is hopefully additional shareholder value. But what was so hard for the CEO to communicate was any other language than financial language. The guy was a genius. He was at his best when he was buying and selling companies. But when he was dealing with employees and managers and even his top executives, the language he used was an investor's language. 
And we always had very interesting conversations about, you know, there are other things that motivate people than shareholder value. Many of his employees had never bought stocks. So the concept was so abstract to them that it didn't make any sense. So the point about a story or a vision or a picture of the future, it sounds simple, but in fact, it can be quite complicated. Understanding it and figuring out how to craft it. It's not just science. It's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of understanding of realities. You know, when I work with executives, I make the point that that vision, that picture that you put together, it should be at the interface of wishful thinking and reality. And that's the challenge. If you're 100% realistic, you don't move outside of what you're doing. You get stuck in what you're doing. It may be great. It may be generating revenue, etc. But being 100% realist means you understand your constraints and you're going to function inside those constraints. So you need wishful thinking, which gives you license to open your mind, think, come up with new ideas. And not just you as a leader, your team, your executives. There's a lot of brain power in these organizations. And the task of the leader is not to be the prophet, is to be the motivator of people to start thinking, start being creative. I once told one CEO I was working for, I said, do you know, this was an organization that needed to go through major transformation. And the CEO understood it. Some of his top executives understood it, but the rest of the organization wasn't quite sure because they were doing okay. They weren't losing money. It was no crisis. So in one of my conversations to him, I said, George, here's how I define your role. He said, what is my role? I said, you are the chief dissatisfaction officer. Your job is to figure out a way of getting your workforce, your employees, your executives, your managers to be dissatisfied. They're doing fine, but you got to figure out a way of communicating something that we could be finer. We could be better. We could do bigger. To me, one of the fantastic features of great leaders is that they make their organization better. They make their people better people. In many of my conversations, we talk about professional development. We've got to do stuff to give our labor force, employees, etc., the skills they need. And sometimes I remind people, keep in mind, we're talking about human beings. You as leaders can create opportunities for human beings to be better human beings, not just better engineers, not just better, more creative accountants, but better human beings. Sometimes leaders are so focused on making money, producing whatever it is, providing the service, satisfying the customer. The notion of I as a leader have an opportunity, and in my mind, a moral responsibility to help my workforce, my team, to become better people. Now, I got to tell you, I'm not the most objective person about this. Remember, I'm uneducated. So the idea of helping people become better comes naturally to me. That's why I'm in the profession I am. But to me, that's part of the leadership. Leaders are educators. Leaders are people, as I called it, chief dissatisfaction officer. Leaders are people who give license to other people Open their minds, explore, become the Indiana Jones of uh, their industry, push themselves, try themselves, try something new. Doesn't mean it always works. And that's the thing. It's not enough for a leader to say, I give you license to be creative. And the first time you make a mistake, I kick you in the butt. Well, what do you expect? It's not going to happen. So the notion that you as a leader have to engage in wishful thinking to develop the picture. You as a leader need to encourage your team, your employees to engage in wishful thinking is really very important. Now, remember what I said, developing that picture is at the interface of realism and wishful thinking. I've seen a lot of leaders engage in 100% wishful thinking. That's just hot air. That has no roots in reality. It'll never happen. It just sounds good makes some people feel good until the CEO gets another job and moves on. So this is really important 
to bring this picture and to help people gravitate and develop a picture for the organization that people can get excited about. One of the cases I'm most proud of, I worked with a pharmaceutical company making cancer drugs. And to your point, chief dissatisfaction, they were dealing with quality. This was an issue of packaging and distribution. And we happened to have someone in the organization who had two siblings who died of the kind of cancer this drug treated. And so under the area of dissatisfaction, We had her tell her story about she had recently been diagnosed with this same illness. And what happens when we ship drugs with the wrong quantity in a vial? I tell you, everyone in the room was in tears. We went from quality as a slogan and signs on the wall to everyone wanted to ensure that this young woman and her family and everyone dealing with the same issues got the absolute highest quality product, measurement in the vials, shipped properly, all that stuff. And as you've said, this was a production facility. People weren't buying stock. They were lucky to have enough pairs of shoes to wear to work. Literally, the boots that they wore in the facility were expensive, and so they were allocated a certain number of boots. And if you wore them out sooner, there was a problem. So any kind of financial discussion just made people angry. So we needed to find a way to communicate with the production team, who was the core of the business, how important these elements were in the project we were doing. In that case, leadership was absolutely about having a vision, having a story, and finding a way to connect to every human being in that facility through the story that made them feel proud of what they did. Everyone had a sense of purpose when they came to work to help their colleague live through this cancer diagnosis. That sense of purpose, that sense of ownership, that sense of contributing to something that goes beyond, oh, I get a paycheck at the end of mm-hmm. That sense is the leader's job, creating that sense in the minds of the employees and in the hearts. You know, sometimes after a couple of drinks, my definition of leadership changes a little bit. Leaders mess with people's hearts and minds. If we gave you more drinks, what would you say? I'd fall asleep. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's not do that. (laughs) So then let's shift to trust because the conversation here is about both leadership and trust and your current research in that space. Yes, I must say trust is a subject that's been dear to my heart for years. I'm going to start with a, again, a simple definition of what trust means. When I say, I trust you, what exactly am I communicating? What is the message that I'm communicating? Here's the answer. When I say, I trust you, first, I'm telling you that I believe in your integrity. I believe that at the minimum, you will not jeopardize my interest. Put it a little more positively, I believe that you will work towards my interest. Now, I'm talking trust in both professional and personal relations. There is no difference. The context is different, but the definition is the same. So when two friends say, I trust you, this is the first part. When two engineers say, I trust you, this is the first part. That I believe you have good intentions and you will pay attention to my interests and what's important to me. And the second part of trust in the professional sense is I believe you have the ability to do what you are supposed to do. So if you're my team member on the project, what I'm telling you is besides your intention, I believe you have the skills and the credentials and the experience to do the job. The third piece of that sentence is, because I believe in your integrity and intention, and because I believe in your skills, I am willing to be vulnerable to you. And what are some examples of being vulnerable? Well, I'm willing to give you a budget. When a manager allocates a budget to a team member, what is the manager saying? The manager is saying, I trust that you will make good use of this money. So the manager is becoming vulnerable. The organization is becoming vulnerable by giving that resource to someone. Another example of vulnerability is I'm now willing to share confidential information. 
because I don't expect you to share it with somebody else. So these are two important sides of vulnerability. So bottom line is, trust me, I believe in your intention, I believe in your skill set, and I'm willing to be vulnerable because the risks of that vulnerability are low in my mind. Okay, now I'm going to go back 10,000 years. Where does trust come from? And why is it that trust is so important to human beings? Well, if you go back 10,000 years ago, evolutionary biologists tell us, how did humans survive? in the face of all kinds of threatening environmental forces, the least of which are animals. I'm talking the rain and the flood and everything, you know. Well, they learn that they need each other. So human beings thousands of years ago learned that in order for me to survive, I got to work with other people. And in order for me to survive, I need to rely on somebody else. I need to trust somebody. So here's the beautiful thing about human genetics. Psychologists tell us that when a person trusts somebody else, there is a hormone produced in the brain that makes you feel good. Now think about it. This is how human evolutionary biology works. All of those thousands of years of, oh, I trusted somebody, it worked, huh? Da-da-da-da-da. The brain starts learning. It's a good thing. So trust is a lubrication of human relations. It facilitates two or more people in a team, in an organization, in a country to work together. Let's look at the other option. What if I don't trust you? I have to work with you, but I don't trust you. I don't trust your intention. I don't trust your skills. So if it were up to me, I would not be willing to be vulnerable to you. Okay, that's the natural concept. What is my option? My option is to constantly monitor, constantly watch what you're doing. So that's why trust is so beautiful. It reduces my cost of interaction with you. I don't have to monitor you every second because I, in my mind, I've decided I can trust you. The minute I reach that statement or that conclusion in my own mind, I have reduced drastically my cost of interacting with you, working with you, or having a personal relationship. Doesn't matter. That's why we need trust as human beings. We really have no other option because the other option is not very practical. It doesn't work. The cost is too high. So this is the beauty of trust. And this is why humans need trust. Individuals who, for whatever reason, are unable to trust other people end up being lonely, isolated, and depressed. Having trusting relationships is a gift to human beings. Beautiful. That makes perfect sense. Now let's connect that to the research you're doing. Yes. What I want to talk about is a project that's called GLOBE, Global Leadership and Organizational Behavior Effectiveness. It's a research program that the late Professor Bob House, myself, and a few others started in the early 90s. And in fact, this project has its roots in British Columbia because Bob House and I were visitors at the University of Victoria. Bob House was a world-renowned authority on leadership. So in the conversations that we were having, the question that kept coming up between the two of us was, all this leadership stuff that we teach in the U.S., and Canada, Western Europe, it's all based on North American and European research. Does any of it apply to people in other parts of the world? I mean, business schools use American textbooks to teach leadership in Argentina or Japan or China. But does it really make any sense? Does it apply? In other words, the question in our minds was, what is the connection between national culture and leadership? So we started the project in the early 1990s, and we ended up collecting data from over 17,000 middle managers in 62 cultures. And we found that, yes, there are commonalities, such as developing the picture, the vision, motivating people. Yes, there are commonalities across leaders, across countries. However, there's also a lot of differences. One of the most important cultural dimensions when you compare countries, is what we call hierarchy or power distance. What that means is 
how big is the distance between the people who have the power and the people who don't? So how do parents treat their children? In a country like Denmark, which is very low power distance, children are expected to challenge, to question their parents, to engage in discussions with their parents. In a culture like Pakistan, which is high power distance, you don't do that as a child. You're not going to like the consequences because your parents get mad at you. They will punish you. They'll, they'll do all kinds of bad things. So the child learns as he or she grows up in a low power distance. He or she learns, hey, I'm expected to participate. There's nothing wrong with it. I can communicate. So I'm an employee and you're managing in a country like Denmark. It doesn't mean you make decisions. It means you create a process for me to help make decisions. That's a definition of low authority, low hierarchy, low powers. Let's move to Russia or India. So in cultures where the power distance is high, if I have the title of manager, that means I make decisions. Your job as my employee is to follow my instructions. I don't expect you to challenge me, to question me. Just follow, just do what I'm telling you to do. This particular cultural dimension, must be very obvious by now, has very clear implications for leadership. If you're a leader in a very low power distance society, your job is to create processes for decision-making, engagement, discussion. doesn't matter how long it takes. That's how things are done. If you're a leader in a high power distance culture, you make decisions pretty quickly. You do what you like. You decide what you like. And people will follow. Doesn't mean they like it. Doesn't mean they agree with you. You never hear from them. You, you just tell them what to do. So this is how our research started back in the early 1990s, trying to understand the connection between national culture and leadership styles. The latest iteration or phase of this project, which we call Globe 2020, is a study of, again, leadership and trust across 144 countries. I'm project director of this research program, and uh, we started the project in late 2016. We received a lot of funding from Simon Fraser University, BD School of Business at Simon Fraser University, and Canadian government, and other sources. But the major sources of funding at that time were in Canada. And we were able to put together a team of 426 researchers in 144 countries who helped us collect data, who helped us translate the questionnaire. The questionnaire that we created on culture, on leadership, we did the first draft then we sent it to our researchers in different countries. They had to give us feedback and they had to translate everything to their language. We ended up with 138 versions of 60 languages. So we have 16 versions of Spanish because the Spanish that managers use in Argentina is not exactly the same as the one used in Spain. Yeah, there's a lot of commonalities, but there is also idiosyncrasies in the versions of the language. So our colleagues, this team of 426 researchers, worked with us. It took us a lot of time, but we were able to translate the instrument into these languages and then use the local language to collect data. We were successful in receiving over 100,000 responses from managers and professionals in these countries. And then we started cleaning the data. No researcher wants to delete a single data. You know, you all know that. But the critical thing is We wanted to make sure that the respondents are knowledgeable about the culture and are conscientious in their responding. Now, what do I mean by knowledgeable? When we did a survey of Canadian managers, if a respondent told us, oh, I'm not Canadian, I'm not a citizen, I've been living in Canada for one year. Out. Why? Because one year of living in Canada does not make you knowledgeable about Canadian culture. So we actually ask people, are you a citizen of the country for which you are reporting? If you're not, how many years have you been living? And we had a minimum number. So if somebody gave us a number that was below that number, out. Now let's go to conscientious. We knew that if somebody was serious in responding to our questionnaire, 
they would take a minimum of about 15 minutes all the way to 45 minutes. Well, if somebody submitted the questionnaire in 10 minutes, out, because that means they really weren't paying attention. This is not a simple questionnaire. It has a lot of nuances. It takes reflection when a person responds. We had people who took 45, 50, 55, 60 minutes to complete it. So that was one measure of conscientious responding. Here's another one. We looked at the trend in answering the question. So scale is from one to seven. If somebody goes all sevens, all ones, out. Because that person is obviously not paying attention to each individual item. So that's what I mean. This may be hard to believe. It took us about nine months to clean up our data. And we ended up with a total of over 52,000 responses that satisfied our pretty rigorous requirements for high quality responses. So then we had the data and then we created country scores on cultures, country scores on leadership, country scores on trust. Let me talk a little bit about trust. So before we started our surveys, before COVID, years late 2017 to March of 2020, these dates are important. March 2020, remember COVID started going crazy everywhere. That was my last trip. So between end of 2017 and early 2020, I was traveling to different countries in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia. And I would spend three hours with groups of about 20 to 25 local managers. And I would start my workshop with a very simple question. You're working for a local company. You have a new colleague, a fellow citizen. What does it take for you to decide whether or not this person is trustworthy? I would run these workshops and I would put them in groups of four or five, asking them, what does it take? What do you look for before you decide whether the new colleague is trustworthy? And I would collect all the data. And now I want to share with you some examples of what I found. So when I did these workshops in Canada, in the U.S., in Germany, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, almost everyone talked about performance, results. Does the person deliver on their promises? Do they have the skills to do the job? Integrity. Does the person subscribe to values that I believe or I find accepted? Very straightforward. Then I did the same workshop in Eastern Europe, Latin Europe, Southeast Asia, pretty much all of South and Central America. So in Peru, when we did this workshop, first impression, what does that mean? Well, what kind of designer brand does the person wear? What university did the person go to? What high school did the person go to? What high school does the person's children go to? What neighborhood does the person live in? Nothing to do with performance. In the Middle East, can I connect to this person emotionally? Do I like this person? Do I get a positive vibe from this person? Does the person look professional? In India, people talked a lot about tea time and cigarette times. What does that mean? Well, we go out, we have a, a cigarette or tea, and we gossip, and we get to learn each other. I did the workshop with a group in Seoul in South Korea, and they said, we call it MBA. Said, oh, you need an MBA degree to be trusted? No, 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 management by alcohol. If you want to build trust, you go out, drink a lot, and when you're half drunk, you start talking serious. You get to know each other. So there was a huge range ideas besides performance, mostly about the person himself or herself, the character of the person. So trust, very simple, very basic, but the criteria that people use in different parts of the world can be quite different based on their culture, based on their history. And I'm going to tell you something more. Remember what I said about human biology and the fact that our biology tells us that trust is good. There is an organization called World Value Survey, started at University of Michigan. It's now based in Sweden. And they do surveys, interviews of people in up to 40 countries every four years. And one of the questions they asked is, do you have to be very careful with your fellow citizens or do you believe that your fellow citizens can be trusted generally? A very basic, very umbrella kind of question, very abstract. 
in Nordic Europe, 70, 80, 90% of the people say, yeah, you can trust. In Brazil, it's 5%. In Argentina, it's 10%. And most of Latin America is actually really low. We asked a similar question in a different way in our project. It's very similar fine. So you might wonder, wait a minute, as a human being, it's a natural thing to trust other people. So why is it that in a lot of countries, such as Latin American countries, the level of trust is so low? The answer is, yes, our biology tells us it's a good thing. But our life experiences teach us that you cannot trust everybody. Why? Because our parents keep telling us stories of how people were screwed by trusting other people. Our friends lost money or got screwed because they trusted some. So life experience as a child grows up in the society, he or she learns that I've got to put suppression on my natural tendency to trust. My human experience is now stronger than my human natural tendency. So this is how national culture plays such an incredible role in whether or not, what extent, and based on what criteria do people trust each other. Let's go back to the CEO who you worked for who cared mostly about finance. Yeah. How would you want that CEO and all of our listeners to put your findings into practice? Because I assume you did this research so that somebody will do something. Yes. I remember what I was in earlier on, I talked about helping people becoming better human beings, not just better professionals. So I'm going to start with that. The first lesson in what I have learned since early 1990s, and I hope that your audience will pay attention, is the importance of diversity. Diversity in human life is a critical part of who we are. It has roots in human biology. Unfortunately, being open-minded and receptive and enjoying of diversity is not naturally coming to everyone. So it is so critical for our parents, for our schools, for universities, to help people develop a positive, receptive attitude towards diversity of thought and diversity of action. That is a foundational human prerequisite for everything else that I'm going to talk about. It's the mindset. And I remember I once asked the former CEO of BASF, the humongous German chemical company. I said, what was your most important leadership development experience in your career? He said, the first year that I was in charge of BASF operations in Hong Kong. I said, why? He said, because the first year, everything I did was wrong. Every decision I made was wrong. I said, why? He said, because it took me a year to realize I'm not dealing with Germans anymore. I'm dealing with people from Hong Kong. They're so different. Everything is different. He said, it took me one year to understand that and start adjusting. He said, once I learned how to deal with the diversity of Hong Kong versus Germany, I became a better person. I was able to leverage any kind of diversity, whether it's gender diversity, racial diversity, even inside Germany, north, south, west, doesn't matter. Anytime people have different ideas, I'm welcoming. I'm not afraid of it. I don't criticize. I don't blame. I don't judge. I understand. So it took very, very smart, talented guy one year to figure that out. So this mindset of respecting and welcoming diversity of thought and diversity of action, to me, is the prerequisite for all of us as human beings. Now, if somebody has the right mindset, that means they are receptive to what I'm going to share. If you have the right mindset, the next requirement is curiosity. As a leader, you need to show curiosity about everything in life, not just what's the latest feature. Those are good, but I'm not talking just about that. Curiosity about the world. Our world is now so interconnected. That's actually one of the reasons why a lot of people are pissed off. A lot of people are unhappy in their countries. It's because of the exposure to the diversity the way that people do things in their parts of the world. Well, 50 years ago, 
There was no internet. I had no idea what was going on in Peru. Today, I can know on a minute-by-minute -minute basis what's going on in Peru. It doesn't matter. I like it. I was once having lunch with the CEO of CNN International who had just retired. It was a fantastic lunch. He was the founding CEO of CNN International. And he said, at CNN International, we changed the world. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, for the first time ever in human history, we created an opportunity for people all over the world to learn about each other. I said, yeah, and the more I learned about you, the more I hated you. He didn't expect that response from me, but I was being provocative. Exposure doesn't just mean, oh, I like everything I see. So remember why the mindset is so important. If people don't have that mindset, all that exposure, they're going to look for everything that would make them feel bad. And we've got that going on in spades right now in the U.S. political system. My country right now, it's unbelievable that all that exposure is now generating so much introvertedness and so much anxiety and so much fear of diversity. I mean, this is how this country was built, but it's now going in a different direction. So curiosity about how people do things in different parts of their cultures. What does leadership mean? I have a team. I'm managing people in Singapore, in Japan, in New York. What does leadership mean to Japanese people? What does it mean for me to be seen as an effective leader by my Japanese team members? Is it the same as the way that my New York people see me? Absolutely not. To Japanese people, the first step in trust is how polite are you? How quiet? How respectful are you? I don't think that's the number one criterion for people in New York. So if you're a leader, you better understand. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong. And by the way, you can learn from it. You can be a better person by learning about and from other people. So there you have it. Beautiful. So number one is I have to have a positive mindset about diversity. Two is I have to be curious because I love the story about your person from CNN. Now you've told me you're different. If I am a person who is looking to create factions, I'm going to twist that to you're different, you're wrong, and you're dangerous and I have to get rid of you. Yes. So all this diversity crap makes us unsafe and unsuccessful. And you're saying exactly the opposite, but I have to manage for there is a percentage of population in many countries who does see diversity as truly dangerous. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm not just talking about ordinary people. NASA approached me, I think three years ago, and asked me, to design a course, a virtual course, on managing diverse teams. I said, why? What do you need? They said, well, our scientists are having a hard time working together. We have astrophysicists and theoretical physicists who look down on mathematicians and engineers. Mathematicians who look down on applied physicists. So they always come up with us versus them. I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you are. And more important to the project than you are. So the people from NASA say, hey, they're all very important. They all make humongous contributions to our projects. But if they don't stop me and you in me versus you thing that approach, the projects are going to take a much longer time. They're going to be slower. So I created the course. So even the smartest, the most highly educated human beings can fall into the trap of the wrong mindset when it comes to the person. How do you help someone change their mindset? Let's use NASA as an example. You've got theoretical physicists and astrophysicists, clearly smart, clearly scientific, because I assume that how you teach scientists diversity may be slightly different than how you teach the rest of us. Yes, I'm going to use a couple of buzzwords and then I'll explain it. Humility. I'm going to be less humble for a second. The GLOBE project is the largest project ever attempted in social sciences. Largest academic. 426 researchers. So every reason for us to feel proud. I have a team of eight colleagues who are based in Canada and the U.S. And we have been working very closely together managing this team of 400. 
once in a while, I send an email to my team of eight colleagues asking them, watch this documentary on Manhattan Project, on James Webb Telescope. These are incredible projects. And the talent and the expertise that these people put together, these super smart people working together for over a decade to put this thing together, this machine, that they put it together on Earth, then they disassembled it, shipped it to a million miles from Earth, and up there they reassemble. Now imagine, imagine what it takes to be able to do that. I asked my colleagues to watch. Why is, well, for one thing, it's magnificent. It's about a human endeavor. For another is there are much bigger projects. So there are ways that the leader can become more humble. No matter how great you are, there are others who are greater than you. People who are doing things that are 100 times more significant, more important. So humility is critical. Hand in hand with humility is empathy. Empathy simply means that I am able to see the world through your eyes. It doesn't mean I agree with you. It means that I'm able and willing to understand the world the way you do. Instead of blaming you, instead of criticizing you, instead of disagreeing with you, I am willing to show that respect to you, to look through your eyes and see the world through your eyes. These two words, humility and empathy, to me are the critical steps. We created a set of seven mindsets published in the ILA book, Leadership 2050. And the first one was professional humility. <laughs> one of the others was able to inspire followership, yeah. which takes into account the idea of empathy. I can't inspire you to follow me if I don't understand you and can't language what we're doing in a way that is meaningful for you. Yes. So we have a strong alignment in our work that the mindset drives behaviors. If my mindset is arrogant, then I'm not going to be able to drive the behavior of inspiring people to follow me or building trust because I won't have the right intention that you talked about early on as the foundation for trust. The integrity will not be there even if the skill is. And you know, empathy becomes doubly hard when you're dealing with showing empathy to people who are different from you, come from another part of the world, who look different from you, different color, different race, different religion, different language. Showing the requisite empathy in the face of that diverse is even hard. I want to drive that home because I think it's such an important point. And for me, the Black Lives Matter, because I'm a white female, and so I'm talking to my Black male colleague, and I say something like, well, I had that happen. He's like, no, you didn't. Like, the whole driving while Black, nobody pulls me over because I look like I'm going to break into someone's house. I'm 5'3", I'm over a certain age, and I don't look scary to most people. My male... McKinsey, Ivy League graduate school colleague gets pulled over when he drives into his own neighborhood by police officers who don't know him. It's hard to put myself in someone else's spot when I don't have personal access to that experience. In the absence of that experience, what enables you at least to have a feel for the world through that person's eyes is your intellectual openness and your emotion. Because I have a lot of friends who would say, why should I care? So if you don't have the intellectual and emotional readiness to at least try to imagine yourself in the situation or in the experience that that person goes to on a daily basis, without the intellectual and emotional openness and readiness. You won't do it. You just won't care, period. I love the idea of emotional readiness and intellectual readiness, which I would equate with curiosity. Mm -hmm. In our work, we call it intellectually versatile, that I need to be voracious 
in my appetite to understand you, read, study. I need to become an anthropologist of humans, mm -hmm. which in ways is fascinating. Yeah, it should be. That's who we are as human beings. That's one of the key things that separates us from animals, that curiosity. I want to know. I want to learn. That's who we are. And sometimes I meet people who, for whatever reason, have set it aside. I find that so odd and so sad. Humans are beautiful because one of the features is this, that we can be so curious and we can be so open-minded and learn so much. And here's the thing that always amazes. As human beings, we tend to love diversity of food, diversity of fruits, diversity of life experiences. Otherwise, we get bored. Imagine somebody eating chicken breast every day for a month. We did that during COVID, and then we went to Blue Apron <laughs> because chicken skewers <laughs> every day on the grill just really became... It's painful. Not doable. Yeah. So as human beings, we're perfectly fine showing that interest in diversity of food, everything else, except for the human. Isn't that interesting? It seems like that relates to psychological safety. If I feel safe in my world, then I can ask you all kinds of questions and it doesn't threaten me. I was at a music festival this weekend and there were people who were very different than I am. <laughs> they were curious to me. They were interesting because I didn't feel like they were going to threaten me in any way. So it was a setting that I could have an open conversation, literally with a cup of coffee in the morning with folks who see the world differently. If I were in a different setting, that may not have felt safe. There was a setting that allowed open exchange of ideas. It seems like many of our settings do not promote these kinds of exchanges. There are a number of reasons why people avoid or have a negative view towards diversity. One of them is psychological safety. This issue is particularly important in teams. One of the ways that the team leader can help build openness and leverage diversity is by taking steps that would enhance the perceived psychological safety. Because if the team member does not feel safe expressing their views, disagreeing with somebody else, they won't. So you won't take advantage of the diversity. But in addition to that, there are some other drivers. One of them is a personality attribute of, I think in Big Five, it's called openness or openness to new experiences. There are individuals, and I happen to know quite a few of them, who are very low on that dimension. They just have no interest in anything beyond what they're used to. I sometimes tell them, you're like my cat. My cat doesn't like to do anything other than the routine. In fact, gets very anxious. That's how cats are. If you remove them away from their normal routine. Some individuals are like that. So if I'm used to a routine of being always with a bunch of white people, and then I run into somebody who's very different from that, just have no interest. I don't want to have any interface connection, et cetera. That's a personality reason. So there's a number of reasons for people not to have a positive and open mind towards diversity of thought, diversity of action. We need to wrap up here, and I could go on with this conversation for so much longer. How would our listeners find out more about your research or contact you? Well, my email address, mjavidan at asu.edu, m-j-a-v-i-d-a-n at asu.edu. I am a professor at Arizona State. I have a LinkedIn account. People can search me in LinkedIn. And within the next three months, I will have a brand new website for my institute. But I'm also on YouTube and Google, Google me. There are not a lot of Mansur Javidans on Google. Let me put it that way. Thank you so much. This has been just such an enlightening and fun conversation. Same here. Thank you, Mansur. I appreciate the work you're doing. 
sharing and the wisdom you're sharing. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to continue to listen through the entire podcast. Please like us and share us and think about how you're applying the concept of trust across cultures, because it truly does allow us to be more effective, even if we're working in a company that appears to be founded in one country, we're often collaborating with people around the globe. That is true.